Bill and his back home colleagues have designed and produced hundreds of creative protests, trained thousands of agents. They have helped transform mundane demonstrations into cultural happenings with innovative tactics like spotlights to project messages onto buildings and helped introduce the world to kayaktivism Yay. during the Shell No campaign to stop Arctic drilling. Bill presents on the application of grand strategy, creative tactics, and campaign designs in workshops around the country. His moral and strategic commitment to the idea that our no is only as powerful as our yes is compelling. Resulted, um, and yes, it's compelling, and it has resulted in solu the Solutionary Rail project. Does everybody know about Solutionary Rail? Yeah. Check it out online, Solutionary Rail. Okay, Bill convened and directs the Solutionary Rail team to plot a path to U.S. to transform a broken and dangerous railroad business model into a catalyst for social and environmental solutions that can act as an integral, integral component of a just transition to a sustainable society. Bill is proud to provide the strategic tool to bring together unlikely allies in otherwise divisive times. Bill Moyer. It's kind of what's sort of amazing actually about being here and why it is such an honor for me. Um, when I was 17, 18 years old, this guy named Michael Ramos was a Jesuit volunteer corps, uh, part of a community at St. Leo's in Tacoma with Father Roth Rock and Bick Soul. And, and, um, and my family went to that, uh, that parish and we were friends with this young guy named Mike Ramos. And I don't know, does anybody know who Michael Ramos is now? He's the ED or other church council of Greater Seattle, right? <coughs> yeah. So Michael uh, said, Bill, you know, maybe you should come out with me to Ground Zero, you know, and uh, check it out. Because I was interested in activism stuff since I was in eighth grade. <laughs> <laughs> Middle school, yeah, thanks to uh, uh, Mr. Shireman. Uh, first protest was with Adam Bauer. We went down to a Greenpeace protest at the, at the Canadian consulate because they were, you know, beating, killing baby seals up in the Arctic. But over the years, uh, you know, I, I, when I was, you know, I was, well, at that time, I was really interested and scared. I was waking up in the middle of the night now, I remember actually, thinking that maybe the light outside was the nuclear blast. I was dream having nightmares of the planes flying overhead. The idea of the nuclear, the imminent nuclear war was haunting to my teenage imagination. And, uh, and so to read First Strike, by Robert Aldridge, and then to come out here and to get to meet Jim and Shelley Douglas, and and was really a powerful moment for me as a young person, and really formative in the to get to see people taking action and really being innovative in their actions. Uh, you know, I I didn't really realize that you all were way ahead of us in terms of using the water for activism until recently, okay? Uh, but there was a cute article uh, from, a cute article, um, from 2015, right after the Kai activists did their thing in Seattle, which Backbone was central to. And um, yeah, that was something we're really proud of. Uh, there's, it's all very complicated sometimes, but uh, we are very proud of it. Um, and the, to see the, the challenging of people at the gates and the, uh, that was all very impactful for me. And so as I prepared, I was to come here, uh, a couple of things happened, right? A couple of really important things that I feel like we're all probably pretty connected to. And um, the first was the passing of Archbishop Hunthausen. Yeah. 
you know, I, I, I haven't gotten very many awards in my life or very many degrees. And the only one that I really care about was the Archbishop Hunthausen Service Award I got at Seattle University when I was an activist there. That was the only thing I really cared about. And, um, and to get to meet that humble man and to experience him was really great as a young person. Uh, and it was really good to, to kind of remind myself about who he was and what he did at that time and how he was engaged and how central he was for this community. And I'm sure that you, you all know him way better than I, will, I ever did. Um, but the, uh, I was struck by this ideas, these really simple but key points. He was very clear. He was a really good, he was a very strategic communicator. You know, he, um, to, over, to overcome this principle, the difficulty of despair, he gave people an action they could take, right? The tax resistance. That was something that you didn't have to be a special, especially privileged in any way to necessarily participate in. And it was, uh, so that was, that was a, action is the antidote to despair is a little pin I used to have I really liked. Um, he also, uh, uh, in his uh, compa comparison of Trident submarines to the, uh, the Auschwitz of Puget Sound, which we, everybody quotes, um, it wasn't so much that they were a tool of genocide, which, of course, they are, <laughs> Annihil total annihilation, but it was that they're invisible. Like the, the neighbors of, of Auschwitz didn't want to know what was going on. They were better, felt more comfortable when it was under the surface. And so he was, um, he helped make the, and with, in collaboration with you all, helped make the invisible visible. And that's what we do as change agents, as people who are thinking forward to the world we want rather than what we've been given. Um, I know there's a third thing in it. So, oh, the other thing that was really great about Hunthausen's position was that he didn't get involved in the like, oh, we have to be strategic, we have to be politically realistic and pragmatic. It's like, no, he said unilateral disarmament is the most pragmatic position to take. It's the most moral, he had moral clarity. He always had moral clarity. You gotta appreciate that. Thank God he was on our side. Uh, and, and so he, he broke through all of that kind of, well, how many nuclear weapons you know, do you need? He wasn't political, he had moral clarity. So um, before we get into what is backbone campaign, I just wanna keep, stay really present to what the moment that we're in right now. So, Hunthausen's passing is a big deal. And it should be a big, I know it's a big deal for this community because you just, I heard that you spent an hour and a half yesterday and that uh, didn't Jim Douglas or Wa which, Wallace or somebody had a, a piece of writing that was very beautiful, I checked it out. Um, but the other, what, what's the other thing you think I'm gonna mention right now? What else is happening right now that everybody's paying attention to? More specific, thank you. Orca whale, Telequa. I was lucky enough to just be traveling in Spain with my family, and uh, and I started to see the news reports. Uh, I think when I landed in D.C. for a couple of days, and everyone was talking about her grief and identifying with her grief, and that you know that resonates. But after a few days. It seemed inadequate. It seemed to me that it was, it was not actually honoring her for her intelligence also. Not just that she's, of course we're, she's gonna have grief and of course we, it's, an, it's important that we feel that grief. I'm not trying to dis, I'm not to diminish that. I just don't want to diminish her intelligence either. I don't want to diminish her capacity for intentional action. I don't want to diminish her capacity to attempt to communicate with us. 
There you go. She, she is, and that's a really profound thing to even consider. When was the last time you had to even consider whether another species, besides your dog or your cat, was trying to communicate with you? Has anybody heard of the orca whale that is, his calf died within about a half an hour of its birth, and she has been pushing it, with her, keeping it uh, with her and her pod for like 10 days now? More than 10 days. And it's been, people have witnessed this before, you know, uh, for one or two or three days maybe, but when it went, got to three days and beyond, I just thought it was, I just, when I got back, I just like, couldn't we at least posit the possibility, consider the possibility that she's trying to say something to us? Yeah. Like what a waste if she's doing this, taking this incredibly creative, painful, direct action to make the invisible visible, and we didn't acknowledge it. We just said, oh, she's kind of like obsessed. Oh, now this is getting ridiculous. That's going to get gross any minute. No, that would be really a shame, right? Because her message is, is as important as your message has been all these years around our very survival, the possibility of extinction for all of us. So, and now that her pod is actually helping her, members of her pod, maybe the direct relatives more, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but are helping her push this baby, keep this carcass up for, uh, with them. So, to me, I just wanted to bring that, because to me there's something really sacred about our ancestors and the, the um, you know, teachers like... Uh, Raymond Hunthausen, and something really sacred about the place we live and the waters we get to go on and this, and this moment where we get to remember them and all that they've given us, as well as uh, what's, uh, what can we learn from them right now? And we have this teacher, Telequa is her given name. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, or it's better than like number 35, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, and I just want to, I want to, I want to Im, infuse our work together and with the energy of Telequa and, and Raymond Hunthausen. I want us to remember how vital Ground Zero was during that time. The threat hasn't become that much less, but we're not feeling that same vitality and urgency, right? And yet, we look at Telequa. Everybody's feeling the urgency of Telequa. This, she is a change agent. She is doing more to save the Puget Sound than any activist organization ever could or has or will ever do, right? She, and the fact that we're experiencing this from another, I mean, this is just blowing my mind. So I'm hoping that as we get, dig into some of the like nuts and bolts of grand strategy, that we'll come back to the essence of how do we take moral action in a fight that is really, whether you're in Gaza or you're dealing with climate, or you're stopping LNG in the 253, it's all about our survival as a live in, in a world, world worth living in. So, um, all right. Geez, Moyer, you sure talk a lot with any of these slides. Um, all right, so you kind of got a little bit. Backbone campaign. Has anybody heard of Backbone? Who hasn't heard of Backbone campaign before? Go ahead. Don't be embarrassed, please. Oh, good. You give me an excuse to actually show some of these slides. That's really <laughs> nice of you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, so, I, does anybody climb trees? Does anybody like to climb trees? Yes. Yes. Do you still do it? Uh-huh. Uh, you see? Okay. 
uh, three points of contact. That's my takeaway for you today, okay? <laughs> so I like to climb trees too. But, um, and when I was about 22, 23 years old, 1992, um, I was up in this tree and I was watching the sunset on Vashon as a fir tree. And what do you like about being at the top of the tree? What's the view, the view, right? Do you remember, do you see the rolling? Or like when you're on the top of a ridge and you see the rolling canopy and you see from the top and you see the birds like, you know, coming out of it like at the water, you know, it's like, and they're flitting from treetop to treetop and the crows are doing their thing, going to the sun or going away from the sun or whatever the hell their thing is. Um, and then, um, so that was beautiful. I'm like, yeah, this is beautiful. Nature's beautiful. I'm part of nature. We're all beautiful. I'm beautiful. I stepped down, crack. The branch I stepped on broke. Bummer. <laughs> I lost my grip. I fell backwards. And I was 50, 60 feet up. And I was smart enough to know that this to say to myself, and this is all I said, no real emotion around it, just like this could be it. As I fell to the ground. I don't know what happened. You know, there were probably dead branches in between two trees that slowed me down. Regardless, I hit the ground. I'm alive, I think. I think I'm alive. I think, I, yeah, I lived. Yeah, cool. I, 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 no, I died. That was it. Yeah. No, so you know it's a good ending, right? So um, it depends on which side you're on. Um, so, so then uh, I, I, my arms weren't broken. Like I would fallen off a ladder and broken my arm, and that looks really scary. And my legs weren't broken. I'm like, huh, cool. I got a lucky guy. Um, so then I tried to get up. Oh, ooh, not so much. Uh, so T12, L1, and 2 are vertebrae in your spine that you really need, <laughs> along with the rest of them, and they were crushed. I didn't know that at the time. I just knew that I couldn't actually, I thought about getting up, but I couldn't actually manifest it. Like, don't you feel that way? Like, we want nuclear disarmament. <laughs> Having a hard time manifesting it, though. Right? And that's what that metaphor has been for me. Luckily, my buddy Donald came and he, he, um, he uh, found me under the tree. He was coming to visit me, thank God. Because I was starting to lose breath. When you fall that far, stuff happens inside to your lungs. And the blood was collecting. Anyway, they got me on a board and they stabilized my neck. And then they got me in an aid car and put a flutter valve in my chest and release the, anyway, I'm fine, it was fine. I had two big surgeries, we can sh show off the scars some other time when we're drinking. <laughs> um, but um, the, um, the big metaphor is that other thing though, right? It's like you have an aspiration, but you cannot manifest that aspiration. You can't make it happen in the world that you live in. Mine was simple, I wanted to get up. A lot of us have a lot of, we have a lot bigger aspirations, you know, Universal health care, uh, world peace, you know, but it's hard to manifest them in the world. And so for me, that has become a really good reason, excuse to have named it Backbone Campaign. Besides, with some friends, we just thought it'd be super funny if we brought a giant backbone to the Democrats. And so we built like this 70 foot long spandex backbone in 2004 and brought it to their convention. And that's where, it's, and we started giving out backbone awards and spineless citations. And we were just riffing on theme and variation, you know, anything we could do. Um, but to me, it's more important than giving the Democrats a backbone, which that operation never took, by the way. I don't know, maybe you noticed. Um, it's really about we the people having backbone. It's about if we want to manifest our aspirations, what we, the world we want to live in, we need to have the power to do so. And that power is what I think is what we call social movement. Right? So it's a great metaphor anyway, right? It's flexible, it's strong, it's the center of your being, it's the core of your values, et cetera. So, so Backbone Campaign's kind of elongated mission statement, kind of elongated like my bio. Um, Backbone Campaign amplifies the aspirations of we, why don't this be the participatory part? Let's all read it aloud. 
Backbone campaign amplifies the aspirations of we the people with creative strategies and artful activism to manifest a world where life, community, nature, and our obligations to future generations are honored as sacred. All right, I know, it's so mouthful. It might be more than three ideas, I'm not sure. I'll let it count. But all these fights that we fight, you know, the reason we did the backbone first, and I'm not going to show you the scars, I'm just going to show you the back of the shirt. Right? Right? Oh, sorry. Ed, and I, I just screwed up. Oh, yeah. yeah, help me out. Right, right, yeah, right. right. See your back. Okay, right. that's enough. Okay, get right. back. Okay, get in breath. Yes, there you go. All right, thank yeah. you. Oh, okay. All right, good. All right. All right. Thank you. I almost lost control there. Ed, sorry about that. All right, you look good. All right, good. Thanks. All right, so anyway, um, all the issues that we care about, they're all connected. Right? You, that's, why we, that's why we all care about them. And, and so, uh, and, and to me, the reason I care about things like understanding the history of conflict Understanding grand strategy and people who study how you win is because I think we're in a battle. And I know that that can be hard when we, to use that kind of language when we're engaged in the peace movement. But I think we're in a, this battle is a moral battle. So um, we, we'll come back to this, but there's, there's Archbishop Hunhausen, for those who didn't know him. And I just want you to notice there's a resist trident button that he's wearing. Um, this is, I wonder if any of you all were in this photo. Jim Douglas was here last night, awesome. Jim Burns. So this is, this is uh, Archbishop Hunhausen with you all in the shaft that was used to be here. I know somebody said no. I called it a shack, and they told me they got mad at me. They said it's a house. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got to hang out with Jackie, uh, the nun, uh -huh. at the federal building when she was doing the fast. Um, and then I don't know if any, any of you here, you early Thai activists. So this is when the Trident uh, submarine was first. The Ohio was coming in, and they were out on the water, and the, uh, people were arrested. And look, I don't know who this is, but. That's a pretty good look. It, that doesn't even look like a hippie. I mean, it looks like, okay. Oh, and I just did this because in the paper they talked about the elected officials, but they didn't talk about Michael Ramos, and he was right up there in the front row at the funeral the other day. Um, oh, and that's me receiving the only award, award I ever actually cared about. Isn't it weird to see yourself when you're that young? Yeah, oh my goodness. Yeah, so cute. So, in building a social movement, going from the power we have, which is not enough, to the power we need to manifest our visions and reach our goals, uh, we have to build a movement. We have, to, we have to start delivering victories. We have to be, create alliances, et cetera. And I wanna go, I'm going to go into a breakdown of some of those ideas. And actually, a bunch of these things, ironically, come from the Pentagon. You've, got the, you've had the intelligence agency is in here earlier today. Now we have the Pentagon. No, Chuck Spinney is a former Pentagon analyst. And he was a protege of a guy named Colonel John R. Boyd. And Colonel Boyd was credited with being the fighter pilot who updated the art of war. Now, he did all these interesting briefings with his team. Um, he never wrote a book. There's a book about him called Boyd. Um, and, and so some of the ideas that we'll go over are there. And so a lot of what we do are tactics. They're at the bottom right? They're of the food chain, right? They're the, what's the tactic, folks? Right, that's a tactic. Any, block, the road. block the road. What's it, keep anything, right? Everything you do is a tactic. What's a tactic? Hold up a sign. Huh? Sign a petition. Sign a petition. Those are all tactics. Okay. Now, strategy. I used to think, wow, this is really complicated. Uh, I don't know the difference, you know, tactics and strategy. Well, what's strategy? Hmm. I'll tell you, you in the back, I bet you know you're a strategic person. 
when you want to go over to a friend's house, you know, and what do you do to make sure that you get to go over to a friend's house? I wasn't talking to you, mister. <laughs> uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm teasing you. Sorry, 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 I'm not, that's not, I mean, uh, that was unfair. But uh, that young, young lady back there. <laughs> she uses logic with her dad and is there things like what did you make your bed do you make your bed on your own or do you make sure that, or do you ha wait until your mom to tell you when you want to go to a friend's house <laughs> yeah it depends on I'm not big into making beds so I'm not whatever so um but uh what are other things like that right oh, so what are things you would need to do to get the permission to go do something you wanted to do Wash the dishes. Honey, I fixed the toilet before I went down to the Nisqually landing thing. So, not to get, okay. Um, but, you know, we do, we do a series of tactics as part of a strategy to get to a goal. So, tactics serve strategies. And strategies serve goals. And goals serve vision. So, we have this vision for... And I don't want to get too lofty. Um, a world where there are salmon runs and the orcas uh, in our future, right? Or maybe we go all out. We want, like, we want electric trains and renewable energy, and we want uh, world peace, and we uh, and everybody to eat and uh, and have housing and have uh, meaningful work and uh, access to health. Yeah, so we want all those things, right? So what are some of the goals we have to get to? So let's, let's scale back the, the, the vision uh, first. Let's say, say we wanted the orca to survive. If we want the orca to survive, what has to happen? What are some things that have to happen? More salmon. There have to be more Chinook salmon. Okay. Okay, less pollution. And one other thing? Less noise. Fewer, less noise and, and no tanker. So let's take those four then. Okay, so those are goals towards that vision. So the goals of Chinook salmon. So each one we're going to need strategies for, and we're probably going to need sub-strategies, and we're probably going to use a bunch of different tactics. But what might be a goal uh, to, to reach the goal of more Chinook salmon? What is something that we would have to do? What's, we're going to have to have a strategy for getting more salmon. How, what's one of the things we're going to have to do to get more Chinook salmon? Breach the Lower Snake River dams. Right. So we got to breach the Lower Snake River dams if we want to achieve our goal, which would be part of getting to our vision. So we want to breach the Lower Snake River dams. Who has influence on changing, deciding whether those dams come down or stay? Federal government, Federal government and tribes and... May, yeah, I guess. Huh? Yeah, I think so. And I think that they're, yeah. And Inslee and the farm, yes, yeah, special interests. Um, and, uh, and maybe uh, Attorney General um, Bob Ferguson, you know. And, and, and Bob Ferguson, you know, he kind of screwed up recently. He, he went and he did, went to the Supreme Court against the tribes of Washington State. Right? Bad move, Bob. You know, lots of good stuff, but that was a bad move because the tribes have been really the leaders, right? The indigenous people have been the leaders in all of the very the successful anti-fossil fuel movements that we've been part of, right? Give them freaking credit. They have been on the front line, and it's their power, the reason that we're delivering victories. So what does Bob Ferguson and this guy Noah Purcell do? They go and say, no, we don't want to put all, what you, you can't tell us to put in culverts. What if the, you just insisted on us taking out dams? We've got it. You can't. That's overreaching. Luckily, the Supreme Court, Kennedy uh, acquitted himself or recused himself, and, um, and it was a four to four decision. So they didn't, they, they lucked out. They didn't screw up too deep. Because that would have been really bad for all of us if the tribes lost power right now. So, um, so we need to go back to them. And actually, I called them on Friday and said, you know, you have a really great opportunity here. To, to sue the Army Corps of Engineers along with the tribes to take down the Snake River dams. You know. So anyway, that's, we're getting in the weeds a little bit there. But um, 
Tactics serve strategy, strategies serve goals, goals serve vision. So if we want world peace, or let's say nuclear disarmament, and what we do is we do tactics, but we don't have a strategy, and we don't have inner goals that where we can articulate, and maybe you all do, but I, a lot of us struggle with these things, making sure that we're not just doing tactics for tactics' sakes, that we're not reactivists rather than activists, and change agents. Who wants to be an activist? I want to be a change agent. I want to deliver victory. Winning is more fun. <laughs> because we're in a battle of paradigms. It's not a battle over this person or that person. It's a battle of values. It's basically, oh, well, let's see. I don't know. Some people think about it as you know, people versus corporations. It's not, that's not a terrible you know, framework, to, way of understanding it. But I think it's even more than that. I think it's that we have a national religion called capitalism. And in capitalism, it comes from this Protestant ethic where you only know that you're going to heaven if somebody else is less well, well off than you are. Seriously, that's Max Weber, you know, and, uh, was analyzing that um, some time ago. And um, so for ca in this system, with capitalism as the national religion, um, actually, the inequality is a sacrament of capitalism. You have to have inequality if you're going to prove that you're chosen and you're going to go up with in the rap rapture like a bottle rocket. So then that gives you, you know, the 1% and uh, everybody else, the 99. And the shining on a hill is just a reference, a historical reference. Okay. Here's another participatory part. I know this really boring participatory parts, but here, we're going to read this anyway. Everybody now, we the corporations transcending the boundaries of nations in order to protect us from the people ensure our right to extract and exploit, provide the defense of profit with impunity, and secure the blessings of wealth and privilege for those who have it already, do ordain and appropriate this Constitution of the United States of America. Oh, bravo, give yourselves a hand. So that's really moving, y'all. And that is kind of like the creed of where you get things like Citizens United, ah, property rights, then no, why not corporate rights? Right? So here's the first anniversary of Citizens United, and we got a permit. We never get permits, but we got a permit because we really wanted to put a sold sign on the U.S. Capitol lawn. So um, we had Blackie Water and Goldie Sachs and Mona Santo, and Goldie Sachs was like, yeah, First Amendment rights, money talks, I should know. And Monsanto, uh, Mona Santo, pardon me, she's like, oh, but what we really need now is Fourth Amendment privacy rights, so nobody knows what we're doing. And then... <laughs> Blackie Water would have nothing. He will never be satisfied until there are Second Amendment rights for uh, corporations. Okay. So, investor rights. So, there's a rights paradigm. So, when we, we talk about rights, that we, that we, it's really confusing because there's all these rights. There's their property rights, there's corporate rights, there's investor rights, there's even the rights of transnational capital now. The right to cross borders. Migration is beautiful for transnational capital. Yeah. Um, so it's, but that's, those are the defining principles of, that flow from the values where, where inequality is a, um, is a sacrament. That is the paradigm of capitalism. And oh my God, WTF. <laughs> it's crazy. Okay, that's not our paradigm, right? So what is our paradigm? Our paradigm is no, not everything isn't for sale. No, we do say no double negatives, Bill. <laughs> Nothing of ultimate importance is for sale. The orcas are not for sale. The livable oceans, the breathable atmosphere, air, etc. It's not for sale. Human life, your time, honestly, is sacred. So... Somehow, so this is, I think, the defining paradigm difference. That's where you get things, where we get to talk about a more perfect union. And I don't want to get into a conversation about the difference between the Declaration of Independence and the 
Constitution. But the Declaration of Independence is a more of a human rights-based document, and never mind, let's not even go there. OK, water is life. There we go. That's compelling, right? Water is not for sale. Things of ultimate importance are not for sale. So instead of this idea that salvation is me flying up into heaven in a, as a bottle rocket because I've got more than the next guy, what if we went way back, rewind between, before like patriarchy, uh, and we said, no, actually, survival, is, salvation is all, really, it's about the survival of the community in a place over generations, over time. And that community includes the orca, and the salmon, and the cedar, and all the little creatures, I don't know the names of. So I think it's good to think about the vision, to understand why it is that we reach beyond the boundaries of our special issue that we're expert in, and why that solidarity is so important. Because fundamentally, our core value is that we're all in this together. And that's worth fighting for. The rights are for people because we're all in this together. Rights, we of course, then, then we can talk about rights. You talk about rights without talking about values, you get into an endless argument that's what about responsibilities and what about, it's just confusing. So go right to the values. What's sacred to people? In uh, the Defend Our Coast rally up in BC some years ago, uh, the indigenous First Nations speakers uh, were saying things like, the elders are saying that this is a spiritual struggle. This is fundamentally a spiritual struggle, and it has to be fought from a place of love. Sounds a lot like Hunthausen to me. It's a spiritual struggle that has to be fought from a place of love. And that's why I call this spiel, love wins. So this is like first chapter one. All right, like, here we go. Now this is going to get dry and boring. Political calculus. Oh, my God, you got to be kidding me. Okay, what is politics? Some people call politics the art of the possible. Okay. Well, did anybody see uh, uh, Jay Inslee's video this week about the orcas? He did it on Friday, I think. Oh my God, it was so unscripted. It was totally unlike him. It was poor production value. He fumbled through the words. He was like desperate to show up and lead on something, lead on the orca thing. And he knew he couldn't be silent. Why? Not because, why didn't he do it two weeks ago? Why didn't he do a slick video on it? You know? Because, okay, I should have kind of, calculus. I graduated from Evergreen. So, I did not have, I, I went there specifically, so I, I've never taken a class I didn't want to take, including calculus. My, I know, calculus is cool, but my brother took calculus, and we were driving across eastern Montana into South Dakota, and that's a long time, right? Have you ever, anybody driven across eastern Montana to South Dakota? It takes a long time time, right? And we didn't get to talk about calculus on the way there. But on the way back, we're driving from South Dakota through into eastern Montana, I finally said, Jerry, what is calculus? I mean, it took a long time to get to that question, right? There are a lot of things to talk about before you get to, Jerry, what is calculus? And he says, Bill, that's simple. Calculus is the mathematics of changing variables. I'm like, huh? Okay. Um, he didn't really say that. He did say that. <laughs> yes, he did. He's a scientist. Of course he did. He went back to school. He was a bassist and he played good. <laughs> I know. She's, I know, and he's related to me. Weird. Yeah. <laughs> what are you saying? So, anyway, calculus and mathematics of, of changing variables. Political calculus. Oh, ding, 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 ding. I hear him going off. Okay. Now, so, if when we ask politicians to do stuff, forget about it. Forget it. Don't ask them to do, don't ask corporations to change. Don't ask politicians to do anything. They'll just never do it. Or some one of them will do it and the other one will vote the other way and it all even out. You don't get change by asking politicians for favors. 
You get changed by building power as a social movement. You get changed by having, they want, has anybody been in marching band? Yeah, they, these people are like expert guiders. You know, in marching band, you're always looking like, oh, you're, but you use your peripheral vision. Oh, I'm not ahead or behind the person next to me, right? Keeping my diagonal, right? That's politicians. Only they, they like, they like, they, they go like this. No, I'm really leading. <laughs> <laughs> and that was that. That was not a problem for Hunthausen. So, anyway, that's. But it is an issue for Isley, and everybody else, pretty much in that profession. So. Um, don't ask them for favors. Build power. That's the only way we get change. So you change the political calculus. You change the economic variables. You make it so it's an existential requirement for their survival in the world that they live in to do what you want them to do. You change you know, economics. You change the social or the cultural values. So what is Telequa doing? Telequah is waking up so many people, and they're saying, hell yeah, we want the southern orca to live in. God dang it, why isn't somebody doing something about those Chinook, and why the hell is there not even the mention of damn removals in the executive order that you issued, Jay Inslee? Yeah. Shame on you. Yeah, oh, Jay Inslee's like, oh, I'm ready to do a speech now. Right, that's the sh That's what happens. Thank you, Telequah. Okay, so paradigm battle. This is the realm of the politically possible. Right there in the middle, that's the society we have. This is the society we want. This is the society that is trying to take over everything. So we celebrate the nothing of ultimate values for sale, that there are sacred unalienable rights for humans, communities, and nature. And we celebrate the beauty of that. We also toxify, we toxify and decrease the, the purchase of this value system that wants to make everything for sale, the commodification of everything and everyone. And we push it out. So we celebrate and we toxify. We protect what we love, right? If you've ever gone on a campaign that was successful, you probably were on a campaign where people actually cared they probably love something. OK, back into the weeds. Grand strategy. Grand strategy is not a template for creating your strategy. Um, you do not just add water. Grand strategy is about principles for building power, for understanding whether the tactics or strategies that you're engaged in are actually going to work out for you. We'll go into some other stuff that'll help make sense of this more. But the first principle of grand strategies is you've got to expand alliances. You, you know, that backbone, that kid sitting on the ground who can't get up, where we can't manifest this thing we envision, it's because we don't have enough allies. That we don't have the cohesion amongst those allies to have each other's back when the going gets tough and be consistent and not throw each other under the bus. We have reached a level where we've deepened the resolve of our people that this is the most important, this gives meaning to their lives to be involved in this. This is their community. We have to do the opposite for the other paradigm. We've got to take away its, its pull. We've got to find the ways that we can divide Peabody coal from the, um, from the railroad workers. And, um, and the, uh, if in f the, the um, uh, refinery workers from, um, from, uh, from you know, Exxon, et cetera. We've got to decrease the cohesion, that purchase on those people's lives. It's often because of fear. We've got to weaken the resolve of, and that people should not be proud to be racist. That's so terrible that we've gone so backwards. Political correctness was about decency, striving for decency. We, we've got to make it again, so it sh it's just, it's, people should be ashamed to speak of in those ways. They should feel, they should feel like they want to have, find new language. So we need to weaken people's resolve, and sometimes that's making fun. Sometimes we do that with humor. My first nonviolent direct action trainer, Firefly, when I was 19, 20 years old, 
Uh, Firefly was the first person who uh, gave a direct action training at, uh, through uh, our Peace and Justice Center at Seattle University. And I remember him saying that, that humor and awe are incompatible with anger and, or violence. Humor and awe. So, so much of Backbone Campaign is built on that idea. That we want to instill, when we do actions, we want to instill awe. Like, like the 300 kayaks in front of a, an oil rig, right? Right, yeah. Or, or we want to be super funny. You know, we want a 18-foot butt up in the air uh, across from Paul Allen's house saying, shared sacrifice my ass. You know? So, you know, it, it's like, it, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, um, okay, so that's, and then we want to end, we want to win without sowing the seeds of future conflict, right? So everybody thinks about what, what's the, what do people think about a war that ended and then it sowed the seeds for the next war, yeah. World War I, yeah. right? So the, there's, but think about the forest wars of the 90s and the spotted owl, and the fact that we didn't deliver sustainable rural economies, sustainable forestry value added, we delivered a litigious decision around an owl. Oops, because we need those people too. You know, and I'm not saying like, that I know necessarily how to do it better, but I wanna say that when you go into the rest of the rural Northwest, and you, the first thing, if they think smell of a tree hugger, they want to talk about the spotted owl they nailed up onto the barn. So we have to do that. Be we have to do better at that. Okay. There are th domains of conflict. Understanding why nonviolence? Why? Why? Why do we? Why? Why are we so into that? Yeah. Well, because we're these people. And there are those people, well, this is just one of the reasons, right? But do we know where we are here? Does anybody, can anybody tell me where we are in that picture? Who are you if you're in the middle? Or where are you? Gates of Mordor. Thank you. Gates of Mordor. We're at the gates of Mordor. These people are all saying goodbye to each other. They're crying. They're saying, that was really cool. I'm sorry it didn't work out. Um, you know, um, I hope... We can send a raven. That's a different thing. Um, so anyway, um, so then, uh, yeah, and these are the orgs, you know, and all that stuff. Uh, so they're screwed. So we never win by using brute force nor money because our opponents, that other paradigm, it prints money, right? It makes the weapons. It has a monopoly on guns and violence and money. So that's not us. We don't win there. It's not consistent with our scheme in the first place, so it doesn't really pay. Maneuver conflict, however, sometimes when you go to that bank and they're not expecting you, <laughs> and you decide to just set up a living room there, you're going to stay there for a while because they weren't, you've got temporary physical advantage. So we test and we probe the weaknesses of this other paradigm, and we go in and we take advantage of it. And we look for opportunities where we're going to instill awe, where we're going to make people laugh, where we're going to um, make people feel like, whoa, those, uh, those, are, those are my people. Yeah, so maneuver is temporary. It often requires surprise. Kayactivism, you don't get surprised with kayactivism. Too many logistics. Um, but... The, the Greenpeace folks, who I don't have really kind things to say about in Seattle, did really great work in Portland um, by doing the thing that nobody else could do. They had the tactical expertise to repel off the, uh, uh, the, uh, with the bridge. It was over Cathedral Park, and it was which bridge? St. John, St. John's Bridge, thank you. Um, and it was gorgeous. And they, they really made up for a lot of other stuff with that. That was good. Um, we won't go into any more of that. Um, so, but fundamentally, we're engaged in moral conflict. 
We use the maneuver conflict to get the word out to recruit because what we need is we need numbers, folks. We need that whole spine filled up. We need a broad alliances with a lot of cohesion and a deep resolve and that are shifting culture, right? We set up this. This is a great David versus Goliath, right? People are on the water. They're dependent upon each other. They're on the water that they love and they're working to protect, even though we're talking about climate change. They're actually having an impact on something they otherwise they probably couldn't even touch. Like, that's what I hate about some of the issues we have to deal with, including nuclear warfare. So you can't, it's really hard to touch. It's really hard to make it immediate to people. You know, material movements in the past, they make a material difference in people's lives. People protect what they love. It's pretty, it gets really complicated when you're talking about nuclear annihilation. It's very scary, but anyway, shifting the variables in that political calculus by appealing to the deepest aspirations and values. People have to feel like they're engaged in the thing that gives them meaning in their life, and they love the people around them, and they want to come back next week. So that's domains of conflict, and before that was a theory of grand strategy, three pieces of grand strategy. And so the next piece, and we want, isn't a lot more, is grand tactics. Fundamental ideas around the tactics. Very similar to this toxify and celebrate stuff. We want our cause to be the moral equivalence of everything good. Maybe some people, I used to, they say at the Pentagon, they say motherhood. Not everybody has a nice relationship with their mother, so whatever. But, uh, anyway, that's what they say at the Pentagon is motherhood. Motherhood and mismatch. Grand tactical idea. It has to be an unassailable good. When you do something, you, cannot, you can be unattackable. Of course, they're going to say your, your kayaks are made out of plastic, but you got so much other stuff on them, it doesn't really matter. That's just noise. Okay. And mismatch. You got it. So here's the motherhood part. So this is on Maury Island in 2009, stopping an industrial gravel mine. The orca ate there and the, uh, offshore, and the, um, the eelgrass and the salmon, et cetera. So we use the icons. These are sacred. These are sacred to people. Salmon, even if you've only been here a generation, maybe you haven't even been here that long, you can feel it around here. Orca, salmon, the Salish Sea, this is a sacred thing. OK. So, touch into what people love. We the people, this is at the Women's March in DC. We've done this like many times with the giant We the People Constitution. People like that, they feel connected to, to this idea of a more perfect union and working together to that, pledging to that. Mismatch. Mismatch, I'm gonna get out of the wordy slide. Mismatch is about the difference between things, like what is claimed to be real and people's experience of what's real. So trickle down, for instance. People, you know, people still talk about trickle down, which amazes me, actually. And, but the, most people know, I think, hopefully, I don't know, 50, enough, never mind, who knows what people think. Um, but uh, hopefully a lot of us know that trickle down doesn't actually work. So uh, our experience is we just keep getting poorer. Um, the difference between some who, who they claim to be and what they actually are. So BP was doing, they're beyond petroleum for a while, right? right. Yeah, right. Right, right. Yeah, so uh, who's somebody else like that? Where's another example of that? Somebody claims to be something, but then they're actually something else. Peacemaker missile. Oh, ouch. <laughs> ouch. Peacemaker missiles, that's terrible. <laughs> Oh, right. Uh, right. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. GE. Yeah. Right. You're getting it. You're, you're good at this. You've probably been in the game a while. Yeah. I know. You were asked where I learned. That's where I learned. So, um, How about Maybe. I don't know. I'd have to think on that one. What do they say they're doing and what they're actually doing? So, you know, Obama was getting ready to go to Alaska to be the, arc, the climate president, and then all these pesky kayakers go out there and expose that he's allowing Arctic drilling to happen, that kind of was a little bit embarrassing. 
and actually, I got this firsthand, or secondhand, I guess, that a person uh, who works with the Comp, uh, no, not Compton Foundation, the, um, anyway, uh, the, she was in at the White House there helping organize the Arctic trip in the, the following fall. And every, usually everything was cool. That day, May, like, let's say it was May 19th, after the May 15th, May 16th um, paddle in Seattle, the White House guy comes in, what are we gonna do about this? And he puts down the New York Times, the Washington Post with a picture of the kayak activist in front of the thing, in front of the oil rig. And he was not friendly at all. And it turns out that there, all this time, there was a rule that they had at their disposal called the walrus rule. It meant that there could be no drilling rigs closer than nine, 15 miles apart to allow walrus migration to happen. Shell's rig sites, four years, I am sure, were nine miles apart. Nobody ever noticed or said anything. All of a sudden, Obama had a way to act, right? He enforced the walrus rule in like the next week, and all of a sudden, 50% of the Shell's drilling operation was eliminated because of that action, right? That's a victory, um, and delivering victory matters. So, uh, so, uh, so that was him helping himself resolve a mismatch. Um, so it's just the difference between people's the reality, identity, and activity of folks, and it's called motherhood and mismatch. And I'm happy to share this slide. So the other thing, you know, we did this fly this who would Jesus deport over the the detention center in Tacoma. You know, this is not necessarily always perfect. That works really well. Like Obama reject Keystone XL, right? Why did he have to wait so long on on for Standing Rock? I mean, the stuff that happens in November or December of an administration, you gotta say, really? Couldn't you have done that a little earlier if you really meant it? Um, anyway. Here's just some framing that kind of tries to integrate good messaging. So brave troops, you don't attack the troops. We're not attacking the troops. Foolish leaders, that was easy. Uh, um, begin Operation Homecoming. So we're, you know, um, we're do Operation, this is at, right out of George Lakoff. Uh, Operation Homecoming has this sort of respectable military uh, uh, sort of, organizational piece of it. Everybody likes homecoming, except for I didn't really ever like homecoming, but um, I, 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 band was fun. Um, but anyway, so then um, TPP, so this, I was, some folks who were talking to me about, the, get, we did a lot of, back when we did a lot of work on the TPP, and people said, well, um, uh, we, I asked them, so what's the messaging right now? I said, TPP is a bad deal. Uh, that means I could kind of get a better deal, and I thought we're in a paradigm battle where they're undermining their, you know, putting uh, corporate courts together to like, and not paying attention to rights and uh, of nature and communities and uh, labor, et cetera. So bad deal does not work. Like you gotta feel it in your gut. When you get a good message, you feel it in your gut, right? TPP equals betrayal. Betrayal. We all. Oh, who has never been betrayed? <laughs> exactly. So you got to feel it. You got to choose words and phrases that help you feel it because we're trying to grow our alliances, right? We've got to do our campaigns, our tactics, so that we're taking. This is every, how many people have, have seen the spectrum of allies before? Oh, good. That's awesome. I'm glad I'm showing it then. This is a spectrum of allies. This is a way to think about when you're designing your action, what's the goal of the action? You want to grow your alliance, right? You want to create cohesion. You want to give people a sense of resolve. So you want to, you've got your active allies, people you're already working with, physicians, physicians for social responsibilities, ground zero, right? Yep. Are there other active allies? Veterans for Peace. Veterans for Peace. FOR. FOR, right. So we, I'm sure there's more, right? But it's not huge, right? Passive allies. People, you know what? I bet there are a lot of people who don't want nuclear annihilation. <laughs> and they probably, you're probably friends with some of them. Greenpeace. Yeah, Greenpeace. Like, like, where the hell are they? So, um, never mind. No, 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 don't even get me. I don't want it. Sorry, Greenpeace. That was okay. my bad. So come on back, though, Greenpeace. You know you were a really important ally against nuclear weapons at one time. 
What is the issue here? You have all the money in the world, and you can, you're knocking on everybody's door and standing in every neighbor's street corner. Why can't you talk about nuclear weapons, for God's sakes? Please, get on it. Question, every time they ask, knock on my door, I ask them that question. Yes, and, we, and now they're going to get the video. Okay, so, um, they're going to say, that Moyer, he's just got issues. Okay, so, anyway, passive allies. You want to do stuff that's going to bring them involved. So, okay, instead of Bill yelling at them on a video, probably not a super effective tactic. Sorry, guys. We can edit that out. Um, so, do something where they, they show up for their thing or do something. Create a relationship. Somehow draw them in. And I don't know. With a big organization, it's hard. Maybe start with smaller organizations. I don't know. But you want to pull people in. You want to make al passive allies active allies. You want to make people who are neutral, like, ah, oh, nuclear annihilation. <laughs> and, you know, to like, no, we're totally against nuclear annihilation. OK, um, at least be passive allies. That should be a really big bucket over there. Uh, passive opponents, um, well, we're pretty for nuclear annihilation, but we're just not going to do anything about it. And then, uh, and then active opponents, um, you know, uh, yeah, bring it on. You know, uh, forget them. Forget them. Make fun of them? You know, um, you make it so anybody would be embarrassed to hang out with them. And, and, and let them marginalize themselves. And, and, and then and, and bring the passive opponents there so they just don't get in the way of real change. So that's what a spectrum of allies is for. I see that I'm low on battery, and I have this thing even plugged in. Sometimes I have to wiggle it. <laughs> Just in time. Okay. Hey, Bill, I have a quick question. With the active opponents, would you want to expose them? Oh, totally. Like ridicule. That's where the mismatch stuff is like, totally. Yeah, and ridicule is funny. Ridicule is tricky. Because ridicule, if you do ridicule and your audience isn't ready for it, you're going to create sympathy for your opponent. Bad move. And if you do it with the wrong tone, same difference. You know, it's, you, yes? What's uh, the ones that say it's just not going to happen? The war's just not going to happen. They're probably neutral, neutral or passive allies, passive opponents. They're busy with their job. And they yeah, you know, they're probably not worth investing a lot of energy into, in, in, at least at first. You can lower hanging fruit, that's what I'd say. I don't know. I mean, I think. That's my gut from shooting from the hip, um, so so to speak, nonviolently. Uh, uh, th thank you, thank you. <laughs> I didn't want to start a thing. Okay, Bill, he was <laughs> advocating violence again. Uh, so this is another thing that comes from the Pentagon. For goodness sakes, they're just full of good ideas over there. Um, it's called the OODA loop. It's about the decision-making cycle. The OODA loop, it, it comes from a fighter pilot, right? So the guy, he says, OK, what I do is I observe. I know where the clouds are. I know I, where my friends are. I know where my foes are. And, and OK, so that's the observe. And when you know where everything is, that's your oriented, right? And then he's like, OK, I'm going to do this maneuver. I'm going to decide on something. I decide to do something, and then I do that something, and then I shift the reality shifts, right? So then I've got to re-observe and orient and decide and act. And it's really handy if you're doing this faster than your opponent. Because if your opponent's doing it faster than you, you're stuck observing, oh shit, I've got to reorient because they just did something, oh my god, you know, back and forth. So, you know, the tempo matters. That's what we're blessed with, all of this grassroots genius, the capacity to do things. That's why we want, we don't want freaking a national board telling us how to be effective. We want to, I like frameworks like, I like, I'm convinced, I'm dedicated, I'm a little bit of an evangelist on a framework like this because I want everybody to internalize this. So they make good decisions on their own. They don't need the board to tell them what to do. Um, so because you want people using their genius, their creativity, acting, and taking initiative. And we'll get to that in a second. So, um, 
And that's why it's really great that we have a grassroots movement. We, have, we can empower lots of autonomous actors to act. Because if you get, it would be hard if we as a peace movement or as a movement for this other paradigm had to get a consensus before we ever did anything. I'm not saying, I'm not dissing consensus, ground zero. I'm just saying that there is a trade-off. And thank God we don't have to do that on the national level because what we really want is we want all, lots of little spinning OODA loops. We want them coming up with brilliant stuff constantly all the time. And make, let's make our opponents go like, what the? You know, as long as they're in concert, yeah. That's what President Trump is doing. Exactly. That's exactly right. That's why he is somebody to turn off that Twitter machine. Who cares what he's talking about? I'm way more interested in Telequa. I don't give a rat's ass about what Trump is tweeting. I want to see what, tel what we're going to do to Jay Inslee and Bob Ferguson about, because of Telequa and the people who care about Puget Sound right here. That's going to, we're going to win even against all other odds because that's strategic. OK, so, um, so we act in that way. So uh, OK, enough of that. So just to kind of close this section, and yeah, the whole thing, really, I promise. Um, <laughs> Oh, but wait, there's more. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, jeez. What time? Oh, jeez. Yeah, I'm 10 minutes over. Okay, so why OODA loop? Why autonomous? Why? Because even Sun Tzu and knew that variety, these are the attributes we strive for, right? We, Spectrum of tactics. We have to have lots of different tactics. We can't do the same tactic over and over again. Or they're going to know exactly how to react. They're going to train the system just for it, right? They train for it. You've got to make them guess a little bit, you know? So uh, variety, rapidity, capacity for speedy mobilization, unencumbered action, fast deployment. We have, to, we have to encourage that if we're going to win. And winning matters. Initiative. We need to take the initiative. When it's handed to us on a silver platter by an orca whale, you know, or whatever, um, you, you've got to be able to, to go for it. Because you've got to want, you want to get out there and you want to define the terms of the debate before anybody else does. You want them to be reacting to your language, not you be reacting to their language. You don't want them to set the frame in a way. Um, harmony. This, we get harmony by training, by dialogue, by constant communication. We, harmony is really about us not throwing each other under the bus or screwing it up big time by not paying attention to, not playing a little bit by sort of the framework. So we harmonize autonomous action by um, uh, by you know, with training and uh, da, 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 what did I say there? Um, a lot of stuff. Oh, let's read. Thank you. Participation. Harmony. Through shared theory of change, lexicon, vision, goals for autonomous actors to use slash exercise their initiative with rapidity, deploying broad, changing, unpredictable tactics that are in line with the motherhood and mismatch goals in order to pull people to our cause, champion their cause. OK. It probably could use some work, but it wasn't bad. You were great. And as Napoleon says, audacity, oh, he said it in French. Did anybody do French? Right. Audacity. Audacity, 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 something like that, right? So it sounds like audacity, but it's audacity. It sounds cooler. Yeah. So, so audacity. Be audacious. Like do something. Like no way they would not have done that. You know. And in the first ten times, it'll feel really great. But then it'll go like, okay, we've seen that already. So you have to keep being creative. So a good tactic, any a good tactic, is one your people enjoy. If they don't enjoy it, throw it out. All right. So there's the man. OK, thank you.
Yeah. There you all are. Being audacious. Okay. Oh, more audacity. Uh, yeah, you probably should have get, gotten inside the bridge before they closed the zone. Learning curve. They closed the zone <laughs> the day before. Oh, okay. <laughs> Right on, good, thank you. Thank you for that. And we knew they were gonna do that. We trained for being outside the bridge because that's where we had to be. You were there? Yeah. yeah. Right. Woohoo! Right on, thank you. Thank you. You wanna tell a little bit more about the story? Okay. Um, in 1975, 74, 75, we started the anti-training campaign when they started building the base out here. Um, and we were building, we knew that sometime they were going to bring in a submarine and that we were going to get out there and block it. 1982, they're bringing in the submarine, we've tracked it, we know where it is, tracked it all the way. And, and we, were, we spent months before that training people, now, now I, and I was one of the trainers, Jim Douglas was one of the trainers, Shelly. Um, and uh, and friend of ours built 50 little wooden boats for us to use. Mm. They um, built the boats for this section? Ernie Baird, he lives on, near us in Maris Milano. I thanked him for it. He, yeah. And uh, we'll get him here one day. Um, and we had a huge number of people that uh, had been pulled in that you know used to be the the neutrals or the passive allies that have come in and gone, yeah, this is something worth working on. Thousands of people come to demonstrations. Um, and they put in this rule about they were going to close the entire Hood Canal uh, so that if we put, started to put a boat in the water, we'd be arrested immediately. So we moved our tactics outside the Hood Canal and ended up being... Um, <clears throat> Uh, camping out in a little place near Port Townsend, and uh, <clears throat> uh, and we we made a plan. So we had a, a boat from uh, that had come in from Australia, I believe, Pacific Peacemaker, and uh, and they decided they wanted to try and lock the submarine. So we actually like put a rope on the boat put all of these little boats one after another and the boat, uh, you know, when the submarine was in the right place we started out with the boat and then there was another boat with a, a motor but um, so the boat started out and when the uh, Coast Guard stopped them okay, so the Coast Guard brought in all the boats for the West Coast, about 100 boats they were coming in all night long, we, we knew um, so the Coast Guard stopped them and cut the rope and we all and we all dropped the rope and we we're all separate, all these little boats. And um, and the, meanwhile, this other little motor boat actually got out and circled the submarine before the coast guard stopped them. Uh, and um, the most dangerous thing really was these helicopters. Um, some of them were news helicopters, but they came down so low that, it, that there's a it <laughs> disturbs the water, pushes you around, and. and the, um, and uh, we were all taken into custody um, and, uh, and then um, uh, released and some people were charged with, and some people were not charged and, uh, and ultimately no one was, they dropped all the charges. Which was, uh, which kind of took the steam out of our sails. But and also, I mean, there was kind of this, uh, it, it separated us to have some people be charged and others not be charged. Oh, you're, you're more of a star because you got charged, even though we were all there. We were all blocking it. But it was, um, I'm really glad that uh, I participated and that uh, we, we worked together on that, actually. Thank you. Thank you. Peter, you want to say a word or something? Yeah, I can say something. I'll be very good. But I was just in, in spite.
inspired. I think we can hear. I was just inspired by what uh, Carol and Bill were saying. So this is the flag of that boat from Australia, the Pacific Peacemaker, signed by the crew. And later in 82 and 83, they sailed down the coast to Vandenberg Air Force Base, where we were occupying the backcountry security zones against the first launch of the MX missile. And they gave it to the Vandenberg Action Coalition as a gift signed by the crew. And I just wanted to. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. No more joking around about tactics, <laughs> all right? It's serious, right? When you're in there and you've invested so much of your life and then something happens. Yeah, that happened to us during the shall know thing. Um, we got, sh we had been working for uh, six, and, and we were dealing with a situation where we weren't afraid that they were gonna shoot us, right? That really wasn't a thing. Whereas I'm sure you all were in a different oh, yeah. situation, right? Because that was a security zone, not just like a yeah. safety zone. Yeah, they had their weapons. Right, exactly. We could see them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, and that was in a time when people had been killed and were being killed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I want to say something about humor. Um, this shirt shows a submarine. Uh, as a submarine sandwich. A, a submarine sandwich. <laughs> Get it. Hold the baloney, it says, I think, at the top. Hold the baloney. Oh, my God, that's good. We had this, I mean, we continually came up with different humorous things, and there was a cartoonist putting cartoons in the, which one was it? The P.I. The P.I., I believe, yeah. And he, some of them re referred to us, and he gave us those cartoons, and, then, and he allowed us to reproduce them. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I've got one yeah. out in the car, if you want. I'll bring it yeah. up there. Cool. So, right on. Yeah, artful activism wasn't invented by Backbone Campaign. So I just want to be really clear about that. So uh, it's part, we're part of a tradition. And, um, and the dynamism of, of Ground Zero has been a leader in that tradition, right? Uh, so uh, these are those photos that we saw in the beginning. Um, this is the, uh, the orca and I was just going to share a little bit about the, some of the disappointments in, uh, in Seattle during the Shell No campaign, since we, you kind of brought us to that place, a little bit of seriousness, right? Thank you. Um, you know, there was a group of folks who were challenging the, uh, the port to, to not have Shell come in. And some of us realized, well, you know, if they come in, it's going to be easier for us to do an action to keep them there. So we kind of didn't want to keep them from coming because we thought, wow, the opportunity to try to keep them there was more powerful. Um, so, but, uh, but when Greenpeace sort of parachuted into town and um, the, the local leadership kind of got all kind of crazy and it was hard to make decisions, but Backbone Campaign had done Kai activist stuff every year since 2009 when we'd worked on Maury Island. And so I was trying to really kind of help our support, have the, our local crew be able to provide leadership. And so we did, we did call for the flotilla, flew a giant blimp, and then um, and organized, coordinated with the Duwamish uh, tribe and the, um, and the kayak shop that we'd been working in that realm. And so it was a little bit like, oh, let us do this. Let us just do this. Anyway, so, um, but it was kind of like fighting the big guy all the time. It was like, really? Can't you, they, like, no, you shouldn't be like renting kayaks. Or like, well, what's going to happen when people show up and they don't have a kayak? You know, how are we going to get people on the water? You know, like, yes, of course we have to ask the Duwamish for permission. I mean, it's, it, there are lots of things and lots of relationships. So, Anyway, it was challenging the whole time. Um, and then we had that really great experience where, uh, where all those kayaks on the water. But that wasn't a blockade. That was just, that was a, sh I knew that if we wanted people to do a blockade and they've never even thought about doing it, they couldn't imagine themselves doing it, it's really hard to get people to do something they can't imagine themselves doing. So you have to create an opportunity for them to do it without any risk or with minimal risk. And then they get to do it, and they see the picture, and it's like, oh, yeah, we're blockading. Totally, I'll show up, you know? 
then, and, and we even, we worked at it, we did it at night. We had a nighttime concert and a luminary uh, procession because we wanted to be able to hold space at night and we wanted to practice being on the water at night, which is also, how many of us have tried to do that? You know, that's a new thing. There's a bunch of learning that has to happen and you don't want to do your learning in an escalated situation. So, or not or as little as possible. <laughs> and um, and so, uh, so we put on that stuff, and, but then, we got news, we also got intelligence. Now it wasn't like tracking a submarine, you know, that doesn't even come above the water. This is a big thing, you know. We, we knew where when it we knew when it was gonna leave. We got intelligence about when it was gonna leave. And um and he says, okay, well then we'll go out in the morning at 4:30. I'm like, no, 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 no. Don't, then we have to mobilize these hundreds of people that we've been training for six weeks to come out at 4 a.m. We're just going to get to call them at 4 a.m. when it's supposed to leave at 5? That's never going to work. I went out to the barge. I begged them to deploy at sun, after sunset so that then we could have all night to backfill behind them. They really wanted, they, they had something at the barge out there that was going to be their hard blockade. It was a rope. It was cut like five times in the first 20 minutes. And they, they insisted on, on, on waiting until 4.15 in the morning before deploying. So we had like 40 people on the water instead of 300 people on the water. We didn't create a moral conundrum for the Coast Guard that we could have had because the big organization insisted on grabbing the publicity for it. And they raised lots of money from Shell No and Kai Activism and posters and da 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 They own the rights to the images. I know, we coordinated with them, like how are we gonna get the great images? And then they own the rights to them. It's just like, it's really, it's really sucks. And, and, and the fact that we had to let down all those people that had trained. So there's a, it's really serious. Like I, I, I'm really sorry that I made any joke about it because I totally get when you're that invested, it's not freaking funny because you use so much work. So anyway, but Portland went differently and Greenpeace did the kind of thing that they should do. They did maneuver and we did moral conflict. And moral conflict, you don't need surprise. Maneuver, you do need surprise. And that was a good lesson in not confusing tactics. Okay. So um, I don't know how we do this, really. And, and I know there's a whole discernment process that happens next. But there's something about telequa and extinction and nuclear weapons uh, and the annihilation of the entire planet through nuclear weapons. There's something, I think, that there's an opportunity to, to come into alliance with and to connect some dots. People like Hunthausen, people are, some people are thinking and remembering Hunthausen, so he's still, he can be our ancestor spirit who's like there with us at our, has our, our back in this. I don't know how to do it right. But um, even if it wasn't ground zero, I think what I'd be, I'm going to be suggesting or have been suggesting to folks around the Salish Sea, I mean, look at this. <sighs> Is that we you, do human murals. It's a super simple thing to do. And when we did this in 2009, we had to get a plane and a photographer. Now we, everybody has drone, little drones that do the phot photography. All you really need to do is have, a, do, we do this, a grid over at Orca. You put stakes in the beach, do strings to get the basic grid, and then you, you move yarn around, you know, to, 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 to create the shape. And you have people fill it up with wearing black or black umbrellas, whatever. I don't know if this is an answer at all for Ground Zero and, the, and tomorrow and the whatever coming up. But I... Um, I we also, I also brought some other tools that could be of use. Um, banner making toolkit, uh, the salmon and orca inflatables, as well as a globe, an inflatable globe for the earth, like the protect what you love image that was earlier on. You can see them being utilized uh, in this uh, block the gates LNG action. Um, yeah, and then here's just another example of chi activism on the Snake River a couple years ago. Um, I'm not suggesting, I don't suggest that we do anything on the water, obviously. I, you did that yesterday. Um, but, and I don't want us to get into that conversation. Um, but I'm going to zoom forward. Uh, a good tactic is one your people enjoy. So, um, 
it did strike me, I have to say in all honesty, um, that the, um, the idea that you all have three actions a year and you already know what they are is not saying a lot for that OODA loop stuff, right? It's, you're not gonna, it's, there's something, the structure, like a Christmas tree is great, but you gotta put ornaments on it or you leave it in the woods, you know? Um, and so I think that, that you know, that having the capacity to do the things that are unexpected, I know it's a little different with the, the dangers that can be involved in what you're dealing with, but somehow I think you need to, you need to give, be audacious and have, give people a sense of surprise and awe or humor or whatever. Um, and there's lots of things, you know, that, okay, I'm not gonna do that. So anyway, um, I will just want honestly to get back to the contact information. There's a lot of stuff, right? Lots of tactics. It's all just tactics. But it's really all in service of building alliances and growing cohesion and deepening the resolve of our people. All right. Boom. Back one. Love wins. <laughs> <laughs>